This is a story about a dude named Lane. He moved to the mainland and bought one place to stay. And then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one real investor man. Hey everybody, this is Lane with the Simple Passive Casual Podcast. Please leave an iTunes review and make sure you share the podcast with your friends. Because if you don't, soon you won't have any friends to have a midday lunch with when you're not doing anything collecting your passive streams of income. Today I have Ace Chapman on the line. Hey Ace. What is up, sir? So Ace bought his first business when he was 19. It was an online stock market simulator called Cool Wall Street. After selling and seeing the benefits in buying a business over and starting one, he caught the business buying bug. Since then, he has bought and sold over 30 businesses that has helped his clients all over the world buy over 100 businesses. Why don't you give us a little bit about your background? I know this is not quite the uh, typical real estate investing guy, but it's pretty similar buying passive streams of income. Yeah, it's basically real estate on the internet. I owned the real estate business at one point uh, when I was doing offline acquisitions. So my very first business was actually a mortgage company. Uh, that I bought and it was a, kind of a situation. There were some partners, they were looking to get out of it. So I ended up going in and buying that deal. And that was my first, I had bought an internet business before, but that was my first offline business. And also led to me buying a Homevestor franchise. And so I ended up buying uh, those two businesses in the real estate space. Of course, they work together really well. So I built a portfolio of about 30 properties that I ended up selling years ago but, and, and diving back into the uh, Internet deals. And now it's kind of funny, like I, I literally have 32 Internet businesses in the portfolio that we run and grow and continue to look for more acquisitions uh, currently. So how much simple passive cash flow are you making today? And you mentioned that with the 30 internet businesses, right? Yeah, that generates a lo about 200 or so a month. So what is your Han Solo moment? And for those of you that don't know, Han Solo and his buddy Chewbacca from Star Wars were cruising the galaxy as life smugglers, but then crossed paths with Luke and Leia and their life took a pivot point. Describe the resistance that was a catalyst for the change, and did you burn the boats? How did how did you yeah. get to where you are today? Well, it's two very significant points. One, as far as burning the boats, was I did my first acquisition. I'd saved up about three thousand dollars working during the summer, and it was just sitting in a bank account. And I was using the stock market simulator you mentioned, Cool Wall Street. And those guys that owned it weren't really paying attention to it. And I was like, man, these guys are letting the site crash, aren't giving good customer service. So I reached out to him to become an intern thinking, you know, I can help these guys out because this is a great business and I'll learn a lot as well. Well, they wrote back saying, we've actually moved on to another project. We want to get rid of this business. If you know somebody that wants to buy it, let us know. And then you could be an intern for them. And I'm thinking, why would I go sell your business so I could be an intern? But I was curious about how much money they were making. So I was like, oh, yeah, like I know people, you know, I'm a freaking freshman in uh, college. Like I know people that buy businesses all the time. <laughs> and they wrote back saying they wanted to sell it for, for 70000 and it was making sixty a year. And I didn't know anything about valuations, but felt like, hey, that sounds like a reasonable deal. So raise some capital and put that first deal together. And um, that was kind of a, a, a big stepping stone for me because it led to me having to make the decision between quitting school as I grew the business or staying in school. And I knew that I was basically kind of letting go of that uh, natural path of going into corporate America if I left school. And then the second point for me that was kind of that Han Solo moment was I was able to meet a mentor who bought and sold hospitals. And up until that point, I didn't see myself as a business buyer. I saw myself as an entrepreneur. And this business buying thing, which at that point when I met him, I'd done six deals, I felt like this is a way for me to get a bunch of capital so that one day I can become a real entrepreneur. Because like everybody, I looked up to Steve Jobs, I looked up to Bill Gates. I felt like you weren't a real entrepreneur until you started a business from scratch. And so I came up with an idea and I went to my mentor who guided me through my most recent recent acquisition and sale. And I was like, all right, you know, I think I've got enough capital. I've got this amazing idea. I want to tell you about it. And I'm pouring my heart out, telling him about this uh, startup I wanted to do. And at the end of it, he 
I sat down and I could tell, I could look at his face. I'm just like, man, he is not impressed. Like, that's so devastating. And to add to it, he asked me about my computer. He was like, where'd you get your computer? And I was like, Dale, like, why are you looking for a computer? Why are you asking me this? And he went on to ask me, why did you decide to buy that computer instead of uh, going and building it from scratch? And I'm like, I don't know how to build a computer. I don't have the parts for a computer. He's like, but you could go online, learn how to build it, buy the parts and build it yourself. And I'm like, well, I, you know, I just don't want that. And, and it took me a set, but I realized his point. His point was when if we want anything in life, we want a house. You know, they're like one percent of the people that build a house. But most people are like, man, I'm going to go buy something. It may not be exactly what I want, but I'll fix it up and change it. We want a car. We don't try to learn how to build a car from scratch. We just go out and we buy it. We want a computer. We don't try to figure out how to build a computer. We go out and we find one that meets as close to our needs as we can find and buy it. One well, only place in modern society that we haven't gotten over just go out and buy what you need is income. And instead of trying to build income from scratch or go to a job and, and trade hours for income, we can literally just buy the income that we need and that we want. And if you want something else, you go out and you figure out how to buy that income. And the first thing people ask, like, oh, well, uh, how do I get that money? And it's like, it's, you figure it out. Just like when you want a house, you don't write a check for that house. You go and you figure out how to get the money. When you want a car, you don't write a check for it. And even the computer, a lot of people go and get that on a credit card. So when we need things, we go and buy it. And income is the same way. And that was a big transition point for me where I just started. It was like, you know, being unplugged for the matrix. And so that's what I started to focus on was buying income. For someone listening at home, I mean, it all sounds fine and dandy. I mean, us real estate investors, there's several sites that we go to. What's a, a site to get in the ecosystem of uh, online buying businesses? A great site to check out is Biz Buy Sell. And you can see a ton of listings, of course. I mean, it's just the same as real estate. Everybody listening to this knows that the, and even people not in real estate know that the best deal for anything is never going to be advertised. If I have a Rolls Royce for $25,000, I don't need to advertise that. I'm talking to a few people and it's going to get sold. For these deals, you know, the advertised deals are going to be just like what you see advertised by a retail broker on the MLS. These aren't like the really great deals, but it gives you a sense of where you can go to, uh, you know, just look at deals and, and see what the market is like and see what something does sell for on the average basis. If you want to find those off market deals, we show you how to do a lot of that at acechapman.com. So you can go to the website and start to learn how to build relationships with potential sellers, build up a database over time, find people that are going through divorce, blah, 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 that need to get rid of uh, a business and get those really great deals. What's some rules of thumb that I hear like, take the amount of income or the, the net of the uh, profits and you multiply it by a factor of 20, 25. What are some rules of thumb for people to just keep mindful of? And like, how does that convert into like a cap rate? Like, that I'm yeah, to yeah. Have? You know, one of the things when I owned the home investors and bought a lot of residential rentals was uh, having to wait so long to build equity because I was buying businesses. We buy businesses usually at a two to three multiple. So that means that in two to three years, you're getting 100 percent of your money back. So if you buy a business that is making one hundred thousand dollars a year, you're going to buy that business at two hundred thousand. If you end up doing a three multiple, that'd be three hundred. So you never want to go above three. We usually are between two and two and a half uh, multiples so that we like to get about a 40 to 50% return on the capital that we put into a, a deal. And really that's the cash, not our own capital. But on the average deal, that's how that cap rate works out. So that's, that really makes a lot of sense because on a lot of development deals where you're going in, building something from scratch, you're taking on that risk. You're yeah. seeing probably about 20 to 30% uh, of you know, the Class C multifamily, you're looking at 20% mm -hmm. a year. Some of the turnkey rentals are, you know, a little kind of hovering around there. But like, you know, you talk about startups and I guess your stuff would probably be sort of, they're operating businesses, so they're not quite startup land. I mean, startup lands can be like 50 plus, 100 plus, but super volatile, super risky, right? Yeah, 
Absolutely. That space is a is a totally different space, and you got to know what you're doing. <laughs> and it, it drives me crazy because people just go after the IRR or the, the cash on cash return. People are saying, oh, you'll get 50%, but that's just projections. That's like saying if if this happens, then this happens. Well, the first if is a huge if. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. So what's your opinion on building a portfolio of more higher risk development deals, some lower risk single family home rentals and some stuff that you do? Yeah, I um, I used to have rentals. Man, it's been such a long time. I always love trying to make sure I stay in my lane as much as possible. I hadn't done real estate in probably about 10 years. So it's really tough to say I've never actually done like a development deal uh, but, you know, I've seen friends who've done really well with those. I think it's always figure out what you do best and do it. I mean, people like yourself, exactly. you're the active investor. Most people out there are passives and they should find a diversification within their portfolio of all these kinds of little things. That is, that's exactly it. Your worst life or business moment and what did you do after? What was the lesson learned? The toughest lesson for me was my very first acquisition we had you know, offers at seven figures. And then 2001 hit. It was pretty, it was crazy. You know, this is an internet business and everything crashed. Our customers were some of the venture capital bad, like they had recently gone public businesses. They disappeared. And uh, we were basically down to zero. And, you know, I was this 21 year old kid. I had grown this thing. We've gotten seven figure office. I'm thinking, man, I'm done. This is it. Um, and to have that crash, it was completely devastating. I, I now see it as, you know, one of those great moments in, in my life and a great lesson. But at that point, it was, you know, I'm just like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I completely wrote off the internet. <laughs> I was like, I'm never doing this internet crap again. And, and that was one of the reasons that I did the bought the mortgage business next because uh, I had a little bit of capital left um, and had gotten a job with a bank doing mortgages for a while and realized, oh my goodness, I do not want to work in corporate America. I got to get out of here. I there is some money in this mortgage thing, so I'll go out and find a deal. And and the neat thing, you know, that was the thing that I was not used to when I bought a business. There was nobody else competing. It was so crazy to me. When I would go and, and, you know, we would get a, a lead on a home investor deal and then we find out we had to bid against somebody. I was like, are you serious? So so that was one of the things that I had to get used to. Uh, but, yeah, it was it was tough coming back from that. But it was good. You know, I got into a space. No deal that I made an offer on as far as the businesses I bought had any competing offers and and that allowed me to get some really great deals after I kind of left the internet world and started buying offline businesses. Now, something just occurred to me that you know made me think. A lot of people do commercial buildings like you know strip malls or you know bigger buildings, and you know this is coming from the multifamily and residential investor, and uh-huh. I just don't know commercial that well. But it seems to me that everything is going to the Amazon and you know, brick and mortar. I mean, people don't go to malls anymore. They just buy it online. That it just makes so much more sense that the e-commerce and the stuff that you do would be going up in demand and that commercial brick and mortar real estate would be going down. Yeah, there was just a huge article I was reading just uh, today. And, you know, it's, it's something that a lot of people have predicted. But uh, there, there was an article, the headline actually was, retail apocalypse has officially descended on America. And they're they're talking about, you know, they really held out for a long time and everybody's known what was going to happen with e-commerce. But we're just starting to see some major, major after this last Christmas season, people are just realizing, hey, this it's over. Everybody's online now. Um, we're going to have to change uh, the, the way that, that we do business offline. 3,500 stores are expected to close in the next two months. You know, it's those really American Star Wars. It's like uh, J.C. Penney's, Macy's, Sears, even the smaller chains like Crocs, Abercrombie and Fitch. I mean, these were the things that, that malls really hung their hat on as being the ones that are going to be there forever. And then you had those smaller stores. Smaller stores are out the door, and uh, these larger businesses are getting hit. 
All right, I just go to the store, try it on, see what size it is, and then I go home and buy it online. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Not being one of the big boys in investing quite yet, aka the accredited investor in the eyes of the SEC, it's tough to find good options for investing. But then I started investing in the American Homeowner Preservation Fund, or AHP Fund, which is crowdfunding the mortgage crisis in America. The fund collaborates with existing homeowners to keep them in their homes. It's a way to make great returns while feeling good about making a social impact. After investing myself in the fund, it was awesome when they approached me to become an advertiser of the company. You can start investing with as little as 100 bucks, and if you want the free Burn Zone book, please send me an email to lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. <laughs> so it's what's your current two-week experiment and six-month project that you're working on? Well, I'm, I'm doing something right now where every few hours, really three times a day, I step back and, and do a quick meditation, recenter, and get back to work. So that's been something so far. It's hard. I, I set an alarm to kind of remember. It's worked really, really well. And how long are each of these breaks? So it's basically a 10-minute meditation three times a day. Yeah, I think that's the way to go. I mean, sometimes when I get home from work, I'm working from like five to midnight and mm-hmm. you think that's a long, you know, that's six, seven hours of uninterrupted time. And I always feel a little anxious. I need to get so much done. But at some point you're near hour three or four. I mean, I'm just going so slow and I just don't realize it that that mm. little break means so much. It does. What's your six-month project you're working on? Well, I just moved back to America. I've been gone for a couple of years and just moved, just actually got a place uh, here about a month ago. And the thing that I am kind of testing right now is uh, splitting time between Atlanta and Miami. So one of the things I did when I moved back to the U.S. was just that whole realization. I mean, one of the great things about having an online income is you can live anywhere and I think was like we have these social kind of mandates that people put on us that are, aren't reality. And it's like, OK, I got to figure out where my home base is. I'm like, well, no, actually, I, I really don't. Um, so I spent the first couple months just living in a, a few weeks in Miami, living a few weeks in Atlanta. I've had I've got some really great business relationships in Vegas and in L.A. and got to basically take each place for a test drive. So I did, you know, Airbnb, didn't do like the hotel thing. I tried to like go out, make friends, do normal stuff, not the touristy stuff and see what it would be like to live in in each place and really kind of settled on uh, Atlanta and Miami. And so now I'm doing a test to see if I really want to split time between two cities or live in one. And what is your simple passive cash flow number that you're shooting for? And imagine that you had two times that amount. Describe your ideal day, detailed routine, and what projects you're working on. did that uh, a little while back where I was like, okay, like I hit a certain amount. And that's how I ended up going overseas and, and living in the Caribbean for the last two years. And then I realized like I love what I do. <laughs> so it would be exactly what I'm doing now. Uh, I, I get to buy businesses, look at deals, talk to entrepreneurs, talk about uh, growing businesses, you know, the, helping other people figure out how to maximize the sell of their business. And that's my hobby. You know, I get, to, I get to do my hobby every day. So the last question, Tony Robbins identifies two large concepts that we continually struggle to gain perfection at. The first is the art of fulfillment, and the second is the science of achievement. So if you die tomorrow, what would be your secret hack to the first science of achievement? When it comes to science of achievement, for me, very big thing has been focusing on exactly what you love to do and what you're good at. It took me a really long time for me to basically get to the point where I accepted the fact that I was uh, somebody who wasn't going to run a business forever. And I wasn't an operator manager. And, you know, I would get into deals and stay in too long because I felt like, well, this is what an entrepreneur is supposed to be. Like, I got to manage this business. And it wasn't until I got to the point that I really realized, like, okay, I'm not that guy. (laughs) I need to buy things. I, I can grow them over the course of three to six months and then either put a manager in place or get out. Um, And then the second thing has been go like, you know, go wherever the fewest people are. The 
best opportunities are always going to be wherever the fewest people are looking for opportunity. It's been awesome doing these kind of things because just nobody talks about it. Nobody does it. You know, are the people that do do it don't talk about it. So I'm always, you know, when I see that ad on Facebook, it's like, this is the latest, greatest business way to make money. I see a hundred people talking about that. I'm like, wow, this is terrible. Like, you know, they're all selling this strategy and all of these people are trying to figure out why they're not making money. And it's like, well, it's because you're competing with everybody that all those people have advertised to. That's a terrible strategy. I've been taking dance lessons for a few months now and I really really suck but, <laughs> you know ace how many people i'm better at dancing at and what percentile i probably am <laughs> yeah isn't it amazing that's why a lot of people you know they invest in their home state they don't want to go away you know if you just invest away from home where the the grass is a little greener not or mm. because there aren't as many cows trampling the ground exactly what is your secret hack for the art of fulfillment, how do you contribute back? So one of the things that I, I really enjoyed is, is Big Brother. It's a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. It's not this big thing where you're in front of big crowds or, or going out and doing things with a, with a lot of people, but it's been amazingly rewarding building relationship with the guys that I've. And so, yeah, I, I, I'm a very big fan of, of their program and how they run it. Been way more beneficial to me than probably even the kids. So you mentioned you hit the pinnacle and then you went to the Caribbean. Maybe take us back. Like, what, what was the turning point there? Like, what cocktail were you drinking that made you realize that you need to get off your butt and do something? It was just boredom. I found myself getting jealous of my cl my past clients that I'd helped do stuff. And, you know, they were still active in deals and they would call me for advice. And I'm, I would be more jealous. You know, they were jealous of me. Like, oh, man, you're over in the Caribbean. I'm like, no, nah, dude, like I'm jealous of you doing deals. It became very clear. <laughs> Anything we miss? I want to give your contact information out there for people to get a hold of you. Ace.Chapman on Instagram. Uh, YouTube, you can go to aceyoutube.com. And it'll take you to my channel. Twitter is Ace Chapman and, and Facebook is Ace Chapman. But, you know, I, I know a lot of your listeners are going to be people that are already out there doing it. They're already taking some action. They're buying real estate. And so they're going to be more of the people that are like, hey, I'm looking. I want to I want to try this out or I have this specific question about buying Internet businesses. And for those folks, you can you can shoot me an email. You can reach me at Ace at Ace Chapman dot com. And, and I'm happy to answer questions. I also get a lot of questions and then I answer those questions on YouTube. So it could be, you know, you check out aceyoutube.com and I've probably already answered a lot of the questions. For people that dip their toes into real estate investing, I mean, you could go out and find like a $50,000 home that will rent for six, 700 bucks. I wouldn't recommend it for a variety of reasons that we talked through in the podcast, but what's kind of the equivalent in your world? You know, how much capital do you need to put down? What kind of return would you get back? If you put down, it usually averages out on a cash on cash basis of getting your money back in the first year. So I like to make sure I structure the deals so that I'm getting most of my money back between 12 to 18 months. And so you want, if you're getting a two multiple deal, you want to put half of your money into the deal, uh, make sure the earn out is stretched. Uh, so that you are so that you can still get your money back within 18 months. So but basically 40 percent return over the long haul. But I like oh, on the whole investment. But if you structure it the right way, you get 100 percent return cash on cash return. And what kind of initial investment would that be? The smallest deals that I like to do are about 50,000. So you can find deals that are as small as like 30, but they're kind of unstable. I like to stay 50 and above and probably the real sweet spot for good deals is like 200,000. And is that 40% is that cash flow or is it a combination of cash flow and then the uh, sale at the end? No, that's cash flow. It's it's the multiple on on the cash flow of 2 to 3 times. All right, well, appreciate you coming on Ace. No prob, no prob. It's it's great to be here, man. <laughs>
This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.